All right. So I want to thank everyone for joining us for the Ella Projects, uh, the New Orleans Jazz Museums, Offbeat Magazines, and the Guild of Music Supervisors' latest workshop. Uh, this is on licensing music for film and television. Uh, we've got a really good crowd here. Uh, before we get started, I, I need to thank some of the other sponsors for this workshop, the, the main one being the National Endowment for the Arts. So this workshop is presented in part with a grant from the National Endowment for the Arts. Uh, we're thrilled that they continue to support uh, the work that Ella Project does and, and the idea of pro bono services for artists here in Louisiana. I know that we have a lot of familiar faces here, but, but maybe not everybody. I'm just going to tell you a little bit about our organization. Uh, the Ella Project is a organization based here in New Orleans, Louisiana. We're a 501c3 nonprofit. Uh, we provide direct legal assistance pro bono with all sorts of issues focusing primarily on intellectual property, but not exclusively, to artists, musicians, grassroots nonprofits, um, and other low, low to moderate income artists here in Louisiana. We, we also do some patent work. My partner, Ashley, who'll be one of the presenters at this workshop, leads that program in concert with uh, Tulane Law School and a, and a longtime partnership we've had with, with Tulane. Uh, we also do events like this. Um, and the nice thing with these Zoom workshops is, of course, that they are recorded. So we did a really fun workshop about a month ago, which I know some of y'all were on on um, collecting royalties in the modern age that Ashley and Lou Hill of Waterseed Music presented. That workshop is available on our webpage if you want to see it and get some information there. The, the stream's available, it's on YouTube, but also if you go to our website at ellenola.org and you just click on the um, workshop link, you'll bring to the stream. This one will be similarly there uh, probably in about a week depending on how quickly we turn it around and clean up a little bit of the edits. It's, it's, it's a pretty rough cut, but um, if you have friends who are like, oh, I saw that and I missed it and I really wanted to come, well, guess what? It'll be available there as well. Um, December 9th, we'll be doing a conversation on the upcoming Music Licensing Collective. Uh, that promotion hasn't gone out yet, but, but it'll go out by email relatively soon. Um, hope all y'all have signed up for our, for our email list. If you haven't, you can do it at lnola.org. Okay. So that's the housekeeping overall. I want to talk about today's event. Um, I think we've just established a really strong panel here today, um, including Ashley Keaton, co-founder of the Ella Project, Joel C. High, music supervisor and president of the Guild of Music Supervisors, Jay Weigel, a, a local composer, many years was the um, executive director of the Contemporary Arts Center and has had a very interesting career in music that a lot of people who may have known him from the CSC days may not know all about, and we're going to hear a lot about that today. And of course, the great John Cleary, uh, famous New Orleans musician, keyboardist of Bonnie Raitt, and all around um, gentleman and scholar. So um, I think we're going to have a lot of fun today. I think we're going to get a lot of good information out there. Uh, for more information on our panelists in the chat, you're going to be able to see links to all their bios. Um, and let's talk about the chat for a little bit. So what we'll do is I'll be monitoring the chat. Um, it's a great opportunity to type in questions. What we're going to do, though, is probably hold them to the end. And that way, if something is going to be addressed in the conversation, um, you know, we'll address it and the question will hopefully at that point become mute. But we will be following the chat and towards the end, we'll use that to, to gain all the questions and make sure that, that you all get all your stuff answered. Um, so. Without further ado, I'm going, to, I'm going to pass the virtual microphone over to my friend and colleague, Ashley Keaton, who's going to take us from here. Thanks, Ashley. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction. Such a pleasure to be here today with all of you. And um, Joel, you have your hand up. Or do you mean to have your, oh, clap, clap, clap. <laughs> <laughs> that was Still getting used to these symbols, right? That's OK. But it's also a, a, a lot of fun for me and you know, beyond like the professional aspect of all this, just to reunite in one virtual room, all of you, but um, of course, but Joel C. High is a dear friend. We go way back. Jay Weigel, obviously, same thing. And John Cleary, we were talking about when we'd all seen each other last. And I told John, I saw him at the airport about a year ago. Mm -mm, not seeing each other at the airport now. Airports, I remember them. Yeah, 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 that was fun. It was fun. It's always fun running into people at the airport, as long as you're not running to the, to the uh, terminal, which is something that I have not been worried about lately, but I know some of you have um, been getting out and about a little bit more. Um, 
So today, you know, what I would like to do is spend a little, as little time, my goal for me is to spend as little time on the screen as possible because I'm the least interesting person um, in this group. So I'm just going to, um, I'm just going to kind of steer the conversation a little bit, but mostly let that uh, be in through the, in the voices of our three other, of our three panelists because they have much more to convey than I could ever convey about this subject. One thing I do want to start um, uh, with is that for me as an attorney, as someone who has been practicing law in New Orleans for a for longer than I'd like to admit, I mean, you know, look, I'm not like a senior partner at a huge law firm walking around with a cane about to like, you know, go through the, you know, lawyer trust account to figure out what I can squander before I kick it, I hope. But, but I have been practicing long enough to be able to say with certainty that there are some issues that keep coming up with not just, you know, my clients, but folks in the community that are kind of, that, that are red flags for me. And I feel like, you know, part of the mission of the Ella Project, of course, is to help, you know, not just not to just um, provide, you know, resources one on one, but to really elevate conversations around, you know, consumption trends and how the law manifests, like how copyright law, for instance, manifests itself in you know, digital media consumption trends and in licensing trends, etc. And you know, sync licensing is something that. Um, has been widely promoted in New Orleans, in part thanks to the Jazz and Heritage Foundation. They've done a great job uh, with their sync up program. In fact, um, I think I don't know if that's how I met Chelsea High. Like back in the, this is the probably probably through Scott Aegis or through one of the uh, yeah. um, LED initiatives um, around like Grammy or something. Yeah, but this was pre Katrina. You know, so that was way pre. Well ago, that was a while ago. At any rate, they did a wonderful, they did a fantastic job with that, and still do. Um, that said, one one common theme that I keep hearing from um, many clients is that there's this perception that a sync license is a business, that pursuing sync licenses is a business model. So I kind of want to debunk that theory or that 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 position rather, and talk about the importance and relevance of sync license and, and, and more importantly, being prepared to engage in that licensing process so that you can license your music because it can be quite a lucrative um, transaction. But I want us to think about it in the context of singular transactions and not the pursuit of, um, uh, of, of an ordinary business model. Um, there are a lot of companies that are pursuing that that I noticed that have been pursuing um, New Orleans I'm sure other musicians trying to gain their catalog through the sync licensing licensing mechanism and and I, I'd like to caution against that but I'm not going to spend um, uh, this hour how, however long a workshop shop goes um, talking about uh, cautionary tales I just want us to I would just want to frame this properly and I also you know want to talk about and I know that Jay and John are gonna do a fantastic job of this, of the importance of not just being prepared and organizing your catalog to be ready for, for the licensing process, but to make sure that you are availing yourselves of every opportunity um, out there to maximize um, not just the revenue streams that, that flow from sync and other licenses, but to maximize opportunities to gain other other capacity to earn and that's something that I know that Jay can speak to very because I've had so many conversations with him and it's always a lot of fun in fact we spent like an hour and a half at lunch outside um, about three weeks ago talking about that and it was just so much fun so so I know that you all are going to have as much fun as I do talking about the law today that <laughs> transition away from that away from the boring stuff and, and to our panelists. And Joel, you know, I, I hope that you all can let me know if you all can't see. I was having some problems with the chat earlier. Oh, and by the way, I cannot chat and talk at the same time. So please do not be offended if you chat with me and I don't answer because it's just, I, I just can't do it, okay? I can do a lot of things, but that's just, I've not proven to be able to present and to chat at the same time without, which nobody wants to hear. So, so I have an advance for that. I'll try to get to it when I'm not talking. Um, but I'd like to I'd like to start with talking about um, the Guild of Music Supervisors. You know 
the nature of that organization. Joel, if you could talk about your organization and then talk about like your role as a music supervisor, that would be awesome. And just, just to the rest of the audience, just to make sure that you can see the links to the Guild of Music Supervisors, um, to John Cleary's page and to Jay Weigel's page. And, and, and in the links that I sent, I included the link um, to the webinar section of the Guild of Music Supervisors because it's really freaking awesome. I mean, honestly, like I, I, I'm just going, this is everything that we should be covering. Well, not that we should, should be covering because we don't necessarily have the experience to do that, but it's, but you all should be um, availing yourselves of that opportunity to, to you know, gain more insight in, into this process. And that is a great way to do it. So Joel, I'm going to stop talking. Proceed, I, am, I am chatting and talking right now. Because I just put the Guild of Music Supervisors link into the chat. Okay, cool. Thank you. No problem. Um, okay, was there a question? <laughs> yes. If you wouldn't mind okay. I'll, about I'll, organization I'll, I'll, and yeah, about yeah, yeah, your yeah. role as a music supervisor. Uh, yes. So uh, my name is Joel High. I am a music supervisor. I've been doing it for 25 plus years. I got my start um, at uh, Trimark Pictures with a, a movie called uh, Chairman of the Board, uh, starring Carrot Top. Um, and that was back in the uh, 90s. And so uh, it's all been downhill from then. But um, uh, I've been a music supervisor since there was probably about like a dozen people calling themselves music supervisors. And um, basically that title came to mean that it's a person who works on a media project who is essentially the key crew person for uh, overseeing and involved with music. So we do everything with music except for actually create it. So um, my job is literally to start with a script, um, break it down, make a budget, um, uh, prepare for any kind of on-camera productions, uh, do legal work behind clearances, book studios, book musicians, hire songwriters, uh, work creatively with the directors and producers to help husband what the sound is going to be like uh, based on their vision and help them acquire exactly what they want. Um, so, and really to have you know, open ears to find new music and bring it to the, the storytellers to help them with their job. So, you know, we do everything like from hire composers um, to work out publishing deals to making uh, soundtrack albums and work on marketing. I've done everything from uh, uh, films and television to uh, big video games, uh, indie games, uh, trailers, ads, everything that has to do with music in a media uh, context. Um, I'm also one of the founding members um, a little over 10 years ago of the Guild of Music Supervisors. Um, it, it came about because um, there's a lot of misconceptions about what a music supervisor was and what they did and, and how essential they were to telling stories. So we kind of all got together. We're all very independent people. And um, we also realized that the Grammys did not recognize music supervisors for being even a member of the Grammys, let alone getting a, a trophy. And so we, um, the, you know, by that time there was probably a good 30 of us sat in a room with Neil Portnow at the, at the Grammys and uh, basically said, you know, we spend individually over $2 million or something like that a year on music. And the fact that you aren't recognizing us is, a, is an affront and it's really just an oversight by the, uh, the Grammys. And within a couple of months, we were uh, Grammy members and were eligible for our own trophies. So um, the Guild started with that. Um, we've grown now to over 400 full um, music supervisors that are working in various fields. Um, and I've been a board member since day one. And uh, last October, I, I guess I just now hit my year mark as the president of the Guild of Music Supervisors. Um, and uh, we just keep growing. We have a, an extensive uh, uh, roster of people who were involved with the Guild. We have over, I think, a thousand uh, friends of the guild who are um, who are uh, associated with us, and uh, mostly it's it's big. Uh, everything from musicians to the heads of studios um, are uh, associated with the guild, and we keep growing. In fact, I think just today we announced our eleventh uh, annual Guild of Music Supervisors Awards, um, and um, it's going to be April eleventh. Last year we had, uh, we honored uh, icons every year, people who make music and to help 
Victorious last year we honored Kirk Bacharach. And this morning we announced that uh, this year's honoree is gonna be Quincy Jones. So we're extremely excited about that. And, um, you know, we're, you know, onwards and upwards. So how do we get of, tickets to that? <laughs> uh, we're working that out. We're working that All out. Right. If you know people, I, right? You know, you know, <laughs> I was going to say when you were talking about the Grammys, I've, as you know, I've been to the Grammys and to the Music Supervisor Grammy Awards and the Music Supervisor Grammy Awards are so much more fun. They really yeah. No, there, there. Last year we were at the Wiltern and we had 1,800 people, um, and it was a huge, a packed house. Watching um, uh, Regina Spector performed, she was nominated and she won, and Lola Marsh was nominated and won, and they performed. Uh, Amy Mann performed, and uh, who else do we have? Emmylou Harris came out as a surprise to honor one of our honorees and stuff. So. It was amazing and the lobby was packed we have it we say it's the biggest uh event for um the sync community both in terms of the awards themselves but also in terms of the schmooze as absolutely everybody is there making all their connections so it's yeah. pretty beautiful this year much like this but uh we're working it out yeah that's cool and unlike the grammys where you're not allowed to have anything to drink because they don't want you to get up like during commercial break or they hand it to you when you walk through they, the door. They hand it to you when you walk in and they keep handing it to you and they keep handing it to you and it's like, it's morning. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, Life of a music great. supervisor. So speaking of uh, um, trying to, you know, uh, draw the line between your connections as a music supervisor in New Orleans. I mean, I know you have a huge um, love for the city and you've licensed it here. I want all the panelists to talk about the selection process, but I want to start with you, Joel, um, because you, you are the selector. And I, I, I'd like for you to talk about it generally, like what it's like for you, like insofar as, you know, choosing the creative content, but also the process, whether or not, you know, you're willing to, you know, even if you really, really love certain content, whether or not sometimes you're forced to budge from that because of lack of clearances, et cetera. But if you wouldn't mind, talking about that in the New Orleans context to the extent that you can, that'd be awesome. Yeah. That you love licensing from New Orleans. I absolutely do. In fact, I see a couple of people on this uh, chat right now that I've actually used their music. I see Sula right down there. So, hey. Um, but uh, yeah, so uh, I, uh, like I said, I've been a music supervisor for years. I think I was, you know, first kind of on a business side introduced to uh, New Orleans and Louisiana when I was the head of music over at Lionsgate, who was doing so much production in Louisiana, taking care, uh, taking advantage of their um, their tax incentives. And so we would come down and, and work and look for uh, music, you know, while we were down in the city. And it was just so amazing. And so just bursting at the seams with the music. But I often found that sometimes it was really difficult to do the business side of it. Um, and, you know, as opposed to a city like Nashville, where it's like the business is set up, that is like a city about business and music. You know, New Orleans, it really has been traditionally a music city first, and the business has had to catch up. Um, and I started um, about that time um, working actually with uh, Jay Weigel, who's on here with the hat, um, when he was still the, um, the director at the CAC. And, you know, he had, we had discussed certain, you know, uh, similar frustrations about um, making sure that if there was music that we wanted to use, that the business side was taken care of as well. And so, you know, he and I had long discussions like you and, and he actually as well about how, what does that look like? How do we encourage musicians to also pay attention to their craft, but also treat it like a business? And, um, you know, and it's been, you know, like a, you know, 15 years or so that, that we've been having this discussion and it keeps slowly getting better. But um, uh, I've found that New Orleans tends to want to obviously put the music first um, and the business part has to catch up a lot of times. And I think that it's really recently that I think that it's really starting to come to parity where it's like if I contact somebody and I say, I want to license a song, I don't have to explain it a lot. I think that it's, it's more and more that it is um, getting to the point where um, it's getting easier because the one thing about what I do is you, you told me, called me the selector and I am not the selector. I am the suggester. My job is to 
find music and put it in front of the creatives, whether it's the the showrunner on a TV show or the um, the uh, um, director on a film or something, and make suggestions. And then they pick from those suggestions what they like. And then that is what ends up after I do a deal and negotiate that. That's what ends up there. But because I like to keep my job. The one thing I don't ever want to do is to suggest something to a director, have them fall in love with it and not be able to deliver on it because the, the pre people who are supposed to be licensing me the rights to use it haven't gotten their act together on the business side. So, you know, I only suggest stuff that I know I can deliver on. And so when I'm talking to people about licensing something, I definitely do my due diligence and, and, uh, and work really hard to make sure that I don't ever embarrass myself while I'm uh, suggesting something to a director. I, I know, you know I had these conversations. What's interesting to me, at, at, you know, when you say that this is less of a problem than it used to be, I think part of that is that, I mean, you know, 15 years ago, not everyone on this, not everyone that's, you know, part of the Hollywood Squares here was on the, had a computer or was using their computer or, you know, had, you know, access to Wi-Fi, and that's still kind of a problem, but it's not this, the problem that it used to be. It's more, I think that the access to this technology is a little bit more democratized than it used to be. And so because of that, not only are people, I think, a little bit, um, a little bit better prepared insofar as having these conversations about, you know, the licensing process, but also able to actually provide and or, organize and provide provide their content so that you can, I remember Joel used to call me and there's a couple of, you know, um, there was a couple of times where, you know, you were looking for bounce music in particular, and this is before everything was online. And it was like, okay, I, I know where the person is, but I don't know where their music is. And that's changed completely. Like it's radically changed. You know, you can find people's music. And so we'll talk about that a little later about, you know, what the best practices are in organizing and preparing your catalog for folks to search through it. And if, if that's even, you know, something that you're doing these days, Joel, but I'd like to get, I'd like to um, switch over to. Yeah, I'm going to, I'm before you go, I'm going to interject yeah. that, you know, when you say the business is catching up, it has a lot hard to do with people like yourself who are working so hard to educate everybody and make them business ready. And people like Jay, who've been doing it for years and have been working with a lot of the musicians to, you know, really bring them uh, into the mindset about treating their craft as a business. So tip them my hat. Tip of Jay's Thank hat. You. Thank you. We appreciate that. We, we really do. Um, you know, something you said it really resonated with me when you're talking about Nashville being the, you know, sort of the business epicenter, you know, it's all business. And I looked over at John Cleary and I was like, John just is like kind of the opposite optic wise of Nashville. Like you're sitting there, like you're clearly, you know, in New Orleans, you know, you, you epitomize so much of and embody so much of what I think of as like authentic New Orleans, but your business is also together. What does it look like? Like when you, you know, when you've gone through the sync process, and this is something we talked about the other day, what is, what does that entail? Like, because I want to talk about how, you know, part of the sync process, the licensing process is uniform when you get into the actual trans transaction, but when, you know, you're in the, um, not courting phase, but you know, prior to actually making contact with someone like Joel C. High, you know, who is the music supervisor? I mean, it can go a number of ways. What is it? What has it been like for you? Do you have someone who, who's pushing your music out there, or do or do music supervisors come to you because you're John Cleary, or you know, what? And what does it look like after that? Like, explain that process. I think you did in like a sentence or two when we spoke two days ago, and it was pretty great. So. I'm not asking you to repeat. I'm just saying. Um, well, yes, I suppose I represent the, the, the musician end of this. So probably in that respect, at least I've got a lot in common with most of the people that are watching. Um, I, you know, I think often you, if you're musically inclined, then that's a muscle you have at the expense of the, uh, the organizational end of things. So I have people do that stuff for me because they can do it much better than I can. So if somebody hears one of my tunes and thinks it's suitable for something, then I, all I do is direct them to my managers and my publishing people. 
and then I let them take care of all that side of it. So um, I think it's good as a musician to be aware of how your business works. If you've decided that that's what you're going to that's going to do for a living, if that's how you put food on the table, you're naive to think you could succeed at it without doing that due diligence. But to the extent that um, you become an expert on that stuff, uh, personally, I uh, defer to people who are much uh, better at it than I am. And I tend to um, maintain the division between church and state, as it were. I, I prefer to focus most of my energies on thinking about music, chords and notes and melodies. And uh, the details of sync licensing, all that sort of stuff is better left to people who will handle it uh, for me on my, you know, on my behalf and do a good job and make sure that they have all their, their um, ducks in a row. Um, you know, one advantage I think is that most of these, uh, I've made a couple of records for different labels, but I started fairly early on. I made, I started my own record label for just for my records. And so, and I write most of my music. So to that end, I'm a bit of, I'm sort of a one-stop shop, you know, so it's easy if someone wants to use one of my pieces of music then it makes it, uh, it's quite attractive to them, I think, because it's a lot less work. Can I, can I, I want to interject on something on that really quickly too, because I've, I've worked with John, I think that, uh, but I think it's mostly through Jay, but part of the value of what you've done is not only the music you've recorded, but your, your activity and your willingness to work, you know, um, on new things um, and, you know, being available and professional and it's a huge value to someone like me so it's not just yeah. about the 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 the, uh, the library that you've already got it's about your ability to turn something around and deliver something amazing thank you well I, yes i think you have to um as i say if you just you know there's there's all sorts of different kinds of musicians and there's all sorts of different kind of business the music the words music and business ostensibly would appear to be diametrically opposed and the degree to which you can marry them um, largely depends on uh, is, is the depending factor on how, how successful you're going to be at profiting from it. So it doesn't come easily to me, the organizational aspect, um, but that's why I try and, and uh, have a good team around me. And I'm very lucky because my wife was a music supervisor. So in terms of when those things come up, she can immediately uh, point out the right questions that need to be asked and the details that need to be established. That's cheating. Yes, it is cheating. Yeah. <laughs> it's strategic. It's strategic. It's, it's, a happy, it's a happy accident. <laughs> um, well, you saved that one, John. I was worried for you there for a minute. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, as I say, my focus is really on writing. And I most of the music I play is not made with an end purpose in mind um you know i'm very much the uh, uh i'm i hesitate to call my myself an artist because it sounds pretentious i don't even like calling myself a musician particularly but i just play music i think about music all the time and i make it and to the best of my ability get it out there and if somebody hears something they like and they want to use it then as i say i have a good team that can then facilitate that so let's contrast that. Thank you for that, John. Um, Jay, you are your team, right? Like you are, you wear several hats. If you, I know you're wearing a hat right now, but you've got about a thousand others, you know, sitting right behind you. Can you tell us, can you contrast John's process with your own? Well, sure. Um, you know, the way, you, I mean, I, I identify myself to myself as a composer. And so my particular skill set uh, has been around being able to uh, analyze music, figure out how it's put together in my own way and be able to put music together. I have aesthetically music I like to write that's I think of as my music. Few people seem to like it. You know, it's more orchestral and classical music, concert music, but I like it. So that's what matters there. But when it comes to this particular sliver of life, which is how I feed myself. Um, the team I have is made really up of, it's a relationship of team. It's a team made up of relationships with people that 
as Joel puts it, suggest music to other people. And um, the way we talked about it the other day, and you know, John to me is someone that has built a brand, John Cleary, that is based around him and how he plays and the way he hears the music he hears. And when somebody wants John Cleary, you have to get John Cleary, you know, and that's, you pay for that. You pay a premium for that. You pay same a fortune way. for it. You pay a fortune <laughs> for it. And if you that's want Led college. Zeppelin, you know, like if you want a Led Zeppelin song, you're going to pay a fortune for it because that's what it is. So what I have done in my life, because I'm not really, wasn't interested in performing out there. I conduct, but that's a whole different thing. Mine is around identifying and researching what people are looking for. Um, and in the case of nowadays, having done it for a while, you have supervisors that are friends that think of you and they tell you what they need and you either have it or I have a day usually to put it together if I don't have it, write it, record it and deliver it to them. Um, and that's what I do. So I'm, I'm always looking for the opportunity, but quite honestly, people don't, people come to me because I'll deliver it on time. I'll, uh, the paperwork will be signed. They don't have to worry about whether or not I have the rights to it and I can clear it whether I really wrote it or not. There's no, there's no ambiguity there because the writing is the part I like the most. Um, but they don't, they don't come to me because necessarily they're saying, oh, we have to have that Jay Weigel sound the way you might say, I want that John Cleary sound. And there are times I write music that is very New Orleans centric. And I do it usually by collaborating with people like John or other musicians in town and very often co-write. I even do, I have for films with Joel even put in hip hop and bounce and things like this. Well, that's not my forte, but I know people that do it and I work with them because the way the kind of music I do and the kind of placements I get, you don't record just a song. You, you, know, you, you put it together in a way that it can work cleanly in a movie or a TV project. And I'm always looking for a way to do it in such a way that it's going to have a life beyond the single project it's going in. So I've, over time, just from writing and recording, have built up, I guess, what would be called a library, or you, if you're in Nashville, a publishing catalog that now has a value to it that sometimes there are pieces in there that have been in 10 or 12 movies or TV shows and other pieces that have been in one and a lot that's been in none. Um, but that's, it's a very different model than the artist, performing artist, how John lives his life. We live it very differently. Uh, we get to intersect. I spoke to him today about a project that I need him on, it looks like. So he's someone I call a lot, people I call a lot. The other day, I don't know if you remember how you, how John, you actually described what Jay's talking about, but I was dying, I nearly fell out of my chair, I was dying laughing. You remember what you said in comparing the the two of you in the way that you know you you create your content. Um. Oh, I think it was something like. Well, yes, as a comparison, let me get. Jay has an amazing, amazing musical talent that can be exercised and utilized in such a broad spectrum of different styles that he's like a bespoke tailor. You know that can make something that's specifically suited for a task where people would come and get my stuff. It's like off the shelf. So sort of <laughs> my stuff's on the John Cleary shelf. So I'll just have one of them, please. <laughs> John Cleary is an off the shelf suit. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I, really, I, 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 I want really to counter that. Of, it's really a way of pay, just paying dues and respect to Jay for having this incredible facility and versatility to, to, to flex those musical muscles in so many ways and with such variety um, that um, that his music can be used in all the, it can, it can sound like a million different things and be utilized in loads of different ways. That's incredible. Mm -hmm. talent yeah, talent. I, I, want, I wanted to say something about like the, the value you're saying you're, you're like off the rack and I, and I wanted to say the, the value of, of you two guys and I like the contrast you guys are drawing here is you know, if, if I want a John Cleary song, there's only one place I can go for that. I want something that it's going to be something significant and it's going to be something that I'm proud to say is in one of my movies or something and say, I've got this, you know, John Cleary original, it's in here and, it's, and it'll sound like John Cleary and that's kind of what I want. 
And a lot of times, you know, it's like I've worked with Jay as a composer who and he delivers Jay Weigel uh, compositions to me when I hire him as a composer and stuff. But there's other times where I hire Jay and I say, look, I need to find I need a piece of music that does this. And Jay can also switch on a gear and, you know, do he's brilliant at casting. So he can go and call on the people that he knows that he trusts and get them to deliver what I'm looking for. And he's brilliant at it. He books the session, gives me exactly what I'm looking for if I can't find something that already exists. And he's amazing. It's like, it's what I do is, is that, you know, part of my job is all about casting and hiring the right people to make myself look good. And I know that I trust Jay 100% that if he goes and brings somebody in, that they're going to totally deliver. So I, you know, it's kind of like, a, he's like my mercenary. I say, you know, go kill. And he goes and he kills and he brings it back to me. And I'm like, that's fucking great. That's exactly what I meant. So it's, it's, you know, different ways that I look at, you know, how I do it. And I'm telling you, I saw one of these chats, somebody's talking about um, reliable sources in here. And I think that that's key to what I do is that I don't have time to waste with uh, people who, um, aren't necessarily proven or haven't been vetted by people I trust because I don't have time to wait for people to figure out their business side of things. And especially I don't have time for people who uh, are, uh, I can't necessarily hundred percent trust that they're not clear on the writer's share on things or if there's a sample in something or anything like that, because as soon as I smell that, I, you know, go running. You know, I need people who I, because if I put something in a movie and find out that part of it isn't cleared, that's, that's the, the rule one of my job is to make sure that we have all of the rights secured and there's nothing left in doubt. Because if you put something that's not uh, great into a movie or a TV show and it's not 100% cleared, you know, it's, it's terrible. It can cost us a lot of money to, to fix it. So, um, you know, trusted sources are, are imperative. And it's like, you know, Jay and John Cleary are, are two of trusted sources that I would go to time and time again because they've never not delivered exactly what I'm hoping for in each of their realms. Right. To, to that effect, and I'll just say quickly, for those of you, um, we can talk about the legal, uh, the legal concepts that Joel C. was talking about in another workshop so I don't waste everyone's time. But just just a clear, just to clearly um, articulate what you will need, you know, obviously in the clearing process, Joel looks, you know, to he has to first examine whether or not the musical composition, you know, whether he can clear a musical composition, and then he examines whether or not he can clear a, a particular sound recording. That's important for you all as musicians because if you all don't have the proper clearances it's gonna be impossible for him to actually transact with you or for Jay to contact you to, as, as, as Joel's mercenary um, to, you know, in order to, um, in order to you know, be able to, you know, work with you um, in the licensing process. Because if you don't have your clearances in order, then that can subject Joel C to liability. And that means his boss won't wanna work with him anymore <laughs> to go back to something he was talking about earlier. But Jay and John, something that you all were talking about a couple of days ago, and I think this is a, a really good um, illustration of what Joel is talking about insofar as clearances, you were talking about collaborating and about how you had music that you'd actually collaborated on together. I mean, I think you said going back to the 80s for like a Mark Street Beer commercial or something um, that, that you were able to license. But part of the reason why you're able to license is that you have, you know, it is very clear and it's documented even though there's a, a collaboration, you know, who has what rights, what interests in um, the composition and or the sound recording? Do you want to speak to that, Jay or John or both? Because yeah, we have I'll, I'll jump collaborations, at it but it's important that, you know, we want to encourage collaborating in the creative process, but it's important that the collaboration, you know, um, be aware that it's not just about the creative process. It's about, it's about you know, ensuring that you're able to use what comes the output of that creative process of that collaboration yeah i'll start it john and you can pick it up if you don't you know if you want okay. um there are i'll just talk about it there i mean all music creating for me and i think for most of us is collaborative whether uh, and some of it is i write it and then i hire a bunch of musicians who often read it 
especially with score, when I'm doing score, this stuff is usually written out. And I need people who can read the music and play it as I wrote it, because it's been structured to work exactly every 24th of a second has been calculated to work. So that's, that's one type of collaboration where you're depending on musicians taking dots on a piece of paper and putting emotion into it, putting flavor into it. But the ownership side, the part we're talking about today right now, the ownership is very clear. It's mine. I own the copyright on it. I own the writer credit on it. Um, and that's known up front. And that's all covered by the fact that each musician will sign a document that's a work for hire. If it's a work for hire, if it's a union contract, they're on a union contract as a player. And they have given me the rights to use their performances and to sell them, et cetera. And then there's the collaboration where um, I need someone to, who can write a, who can contribute on the writer's side of things. And my rule is very, my, say rule, is a rule. The way I do it is very simple. If, I mean, John and I were working on a song that didn't get into a film, but it was very simple. Before we ever started, the deal was we're just, it's just, there's two of us, so it's 50-50. It didn't really matter to me whether I wrote all of it or two notes of it or if John wrote all of it or just two notes of it. The idea is you're together working on it and you're gonna split the ownership of it um, so that uh, if it gets utilized, the money that comes in and the royalties created, it all gets registered so that we're equal partners. And if there's three of us, it'd be a third, a third, and a third. Make sure though, Jay, as you're saying this, everything's great to do handshakes and stuff like that, but it's always best to put it down in writing, even if it's just an email agreement. Just because, you know, if it comes down to it later and you guys haven't done it and all of a sudden you guys hate each other, then it's, it's it, the whole piece of music becomes totally in, uh, valueless and it's zero because you can't do anything with it because you guys can't now agree on it. True. It's a good point. I, I think from the players then side of things to the co creative collaborators, the right co-writers need to document that so that, um, and I guess you could take it a step further, Joel, and say that you might decide how, who, maybe one of the people that created it is going to administrate it, is going to be the one who decides whether it's going to be licensed into something and utilized so that someone like Joel doesn't have to call three different people or four people or five people to get permission to use something. John said it earlier, you know, that idea of a one-stop shop, you own the recording, the master, and you own the publishing. So one phone call can get his music into something. Anything that simplifies that process and avoids potential, potential yes, I think, agreements is good. I, yeah, I think that's a real potential stumbling block. It doesn't really, uh, it doesn't really apply to me very much because I've never actually had a great deal of success writing with people probably because I tend to be something of a megalomaniac and uh... <laughs> there's value in that. <laughs> yeah. um, I think simple. When I write songs, they sort of almost, almost like, I'm not going to take, I just put my antenna up and if it's a good day and my receiver's working well, songs sort of almost come finished. And so the, my experience when I have collaborated with people, it's always, Felt like a sort of interference, really. Uh, so I haven't really done much songwriting collaboration. Not to say that I won't at some point in the future might have a, a great success with it, but uh, it's the the business aspects of, of um, that is not something that I've ever had to really broach. So, uh, but I think those are very good points that that Jay made and that Joel made, which is uh, that you have to have your your uh, business relationship um, almost in order before you start embarking on a songwriting process with somebody, because if you do it afterwards, there's a lot of room for, for misunderstanding. Contention, right? Well, and Joel said, if there isn't, if you don't have an agreement later on, then the, so the, however good the song is, it's, it's unusable. So right. You know, it's not going to generate it could be the most amazing composition ever written with the the best vocals the the performance has been fantastic exactly what i'm looking for but if i get a whiff of that it's not on the business side taken care of 
gone. It's called kill the baby. We have to just, you know, it, it's going to break everybody's heart, but I can't put anything into one of my movies that's not uh, upstanding. Yes. And yes. John, you know, I know you were talking about the songwriting process and with respect to collaboration and how you don't do a lot of that, but you do, ha you are obviously on a lot of recordings. So when someone comes to license one of your recordings, either they're licensing, licensing it directly from you or through your entire, through everyone who is part of that recording process. I imagine that you probably own the majority of your recordings. Whereas maybe when you play with Bonnie Ray, you know, you record on one of her albums, she may own her recordings. And that's probably because of a document, like documents that you've issued to session artists or that you've actually been issued to at times. Can you speak to that? Um, it's good business practice to, to have uh, paperwork that might be required at a later date. So you have to do due diligence, yes, and get all the releases signed and everything. Right, and I do like what, um, I can't remember whether it was Joel or Jay said about the email exchange, you know, I mean, first of all, for those of you looking for contracts, we have sample contracts that we can send to you. Just contact us and I'm happy to do that, whether it's a work for hire license, what have you. But the nice thing about, you know, everyone documenting everything at all time, whether, whether or not you think you're doing it, I mean, even a text, if you have something in writing that, that memorializes the understanding, the arrangement, that's certainly better than nothing. And it's a demonstration of, you know, and, and actually can be, depending on what state you're in, a binding contract, right? Um, it, that, that serves to help folks like Joel prove that he's engaged in due diligence so that he can say, okay, this, I, I know what the clearances are here. I know what the splits are here. I mean, I, I think it's always easiest and best to make, to make Joel C's life easier by having like a, a document that is signed that, I mean, you can do in one page, but if, you know, if you have to go back and forth via email, I mean, it's, it's, it's enforceable. At least it is in the state of Louisiana. So it's something that, you know, is better than nothing at all. Yeah, and my advice on that too is that, you know, when you're in the studio recording something, have the hard conversation then about who owns what, whether it's the recording or the songwriting itself, have that hard conversation, put it down on a piece of paper, have everybody sign off on it, even if it seems like you're you're the 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 fly in the punch bowl that time, because mm -hmm. Lord knows it's better than having the conversation down the road when I'm about to mix something into a movie and I get a call from somebody who's like, I actually wrote part of that song and they never signed off on anything. So you also have to clear it with me. And I'm like, mm -hmm. oh, it's gone, boom, it's gone. Totally, as soon as that call comes through, I yank that sucker out and it is so far gone. And anybody involved with that particular recording is gone from my life. Frozen, right? right? <laughs> That's a very important lesson, though. I mean, it's like if you don't have your shit together and you cause Joel C's life to be compromised, his career to be compromised, you're not just out of that one transaction. You're pretty much out, right? With exception. I mean, there's very little incentive to work with you again because you've already proven that it, it's you're going to make life difficult for everyone and everyone's ass is on the line. Yeah, there's a lot of musicians in this world who are incredibly talented, especially in the city you guys are in right now. So many, and that's why I come back all the time because I'm always amazed and astounded by the music that people are making. And like I said, when I first started talking is that the business part has to be there as well. It's great to make music however you want to do um, and make just any kind of music, go in all sorts of different directions that it takes you, you know? But uh, my part of it is has to have the business side equally taken care of because, you know, it's it is at the end of the day, it's not my movie. You know, it's, it's barely even like the director's movie. You know, it is like this whole collaborative process. And I have to make sure that my part is totally taken care of so that we can release um, a movie into theaters if that ever happens again. Actually, I have a movie coming out in theaters on Friday, just so you know, Echo Boomers. Google it. Echo Boomers. It's fantastic. <laughs> So we're getting, um, oh, do you want, you, you had more, Joel? No, 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 and uh, yeah, sum it up. Yeah, just, you know, it's important to make sure that 
everything is totally taken care of because like I'm only the I come in and I hired Jay to be the composer and we're like the the house painters for a house that's already built. We're the last part of it, just making sure everything's taken care of. But we're, you know, not the most important part. We just have to make sure we get everybody else taken care of. Thank you for that. So um, to three, and I, I want to have, you know, save room for questions and answers, but something that, you know, I would like to touch on quickly before we slide into that, with, you know, respecting the panelists' time, is um, what I alluded to in the beginning, which was that this is a transaction. It's not necessarily a business model. So John and Jay, I'm curious, John, the other day, you know, I kind of had a bet that Jay had a lot more sync licenses um, than you did only because you are John Cleary and you do cost more, more than likely. But I, I don't think that Jay was prepared for that. So, in, you know, you're John Cleary, you are a, a huge artist beyond New Orleans. How many sync licenses I mean, can you count them on one hand? Um, oh, I've had a few over the years. Not that many, really, to be honest with you. As I say, because I have a particular style, I suppose, and uh, something of mine will get used if it's, if it's, um, you know, if it fits that the context that they need some music for. So it's more of a boutique kind of thing, really. Right, so it's something that you don't really rely on insofar as like you're- No, it's lovely when it happens, but um, as, as we, I mean, that we need to cover the same ground we did before, but what Jay and I actually represent very different aspects of um, the, the music production, people that make music. Um, and um, with me, I always think it's a stroke of luck if somebody happens to like one of my songs and thinks it thinks it would be uh, appropriate in, in a film or television program or whatever. Um, but that's, like I say, that's where I made the, the analogy of being off the shelf. <laughs> you know, that's, right. uh, so I, I don't really have, I don't have loads of syncs. They, they come in every once in a while. And it's very nice when they do. But my, um, the imperative, the, the imperative for me is just making the music. And I don't think of an end use particularly when I make music. Those occasions when I get to work with Jay where there actually is a situation where you have to come up with a piece of music for a particular thing, I find it a very stimulating um, challenge because it uh, represents a different, entirely different way of creating uh, music uh, from, from, from what I do. Very right. Different. And so what Joel was saying earlier on, I think it's great that, that you know, the New Orleans does have this amazing musical culture um, but it is very different from somewhere like Nashville and that's largely because I think the the, the musicians that put New Orleans on the map uh, on two really two twice in the 20th century were musicians who played for pleasure it's just a very musical city and people played here um, because they loved music this is a very musical place money came into it much, much later. And the ethnic folk music of New Orleans was so good that it became the standard all around the world when jazz moved up the Mississippi River and became the rage in New York and Chicago and St. Louis and got exported to the rest of the world. And the same thing happened with the grandsons of those musicians in the 1950s. It was the ethnic folk music of New Orleans. It was rhythm and blues. And um, the people that did it, some of them are still alive and speak to them. They say, we didn't do it for money. We just did it because... Man, there's just all these great musicians around and it feels so good. So the, um, the way the, the, the music reputation evolved, evolved in New Orleans was all around music and musicians and the business came later. And um, quite often, the, I think the wellspring that produces that kind of music is, um, you can see it in New, all of us who live here in New Orleans. It's, uh, New Orleans is not a very together city. It's not to say there aren't together people but it's disorganized and dysfunctional, this place, which is why most of us love it and live here. But mm -hmm. that doesn't necessarily make for a good cohesive music business. Uh, no, but there's absolute value in people. that. What's that? I said there's absolute value in it. That's why it's it's but, so much freer and you can you make music for making music, that, music that yes, makes music for your friends. There's joy in the music and it's part of, you know, you got here on a Sunday afternoon if you're in the right part of town, 
and you'll see 200 people dancing in the street. No one's getting paid yeah. to do it. <laughs> no. That's what they do because they love it. Yeah. Uh, so we say they can be hard reconciling those two things. If you like the music that's from here, then and it has and it has potential use in a context that can generate royalties. Well, um, and it's I, great and that I, if it presents a challenge for the for someone like Joel, who obviously is uh, is doing business um, and needs to have all the I's dotted and the T's crossed. Um, and one of my most important things that I've always wanted to do is to make musicians to make be able to make it that is their how they make their living. And in order to do that, if they're not just strictly performing live and stuff like that, they want to have, you know, ways of looking at making revenue from what they love. Um, they have to pay attention to the business side. And if they don't know how to pay attention to the business side, talk to somebody they know who is doing it and see who can help them. Because if, you know, if they talk to somebody like you, John, who is, who is, you know, making, you know, your love into your business, then you probably have great advice. Go to, to Ashley and Jean who are offering this, this free manna from heaven of, of advice to musicians who they love and want to help you be able to, you know, quit your day job and, you know, turn music into your livelihood full time, you know, and it's not about hitting, you know, uh, giant hit records and, and doing all that stuff. It's about, like I was talking with Jay, it's about, you know, really consistent singles, you know, really, you know, knowing the, the, uh, the mechanics and just doing everything kind of right and just paying attention to everything. There's lots of different ways of making money by making music. It's uh, learning those different paths. It's not just sync. Sync is great because it's a you know it's a one-time hit of money, and then you get the attention, and then you get you be on a cue sheet, and you get money from performances and all sorts of stuff, and then you can use it again as you know. Say I was just on X Y Z TV show, and it builds up a head of steam. And if somebody sees that you're a trusted source, and somebody from you know a, a movie used your music, they'll be like, okay, I think that can go back to them and use more. And it builds up a way of doing it. But it's not the only way. You have to pay attention to every aspect of your business of music. That's a really good point. And I think if you do your business well, and if you perform well and flex all your musical muscles to the best of your ability, sufficient to the point that where people will pay to come and see you doing it, um, then eventually, if you persist, then eventually things like sync licenses will probably come your way. The more notoriety you build up, the more likely you are to have somebody uh, or to figure on somebody's radar, someone that's shopping for that stuff. Yep. And so to that extent, at least in my case, sync licenses are a sort of a peripheral lanyard. Jeff, let's let's contrast that. Real, Jay, you want to you want to go full circle and tie all this together? Um, with your experience and, and how you how you have um, used the sync transaction as an opportunity not just to earn revenue from that transaction but you know that residual mailbox money if you will sure um, yeah my my formula so to speak for survival is is very different than John's which is I think made good for the panel and 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 it has to do with the fact that, you know, I pretty early on uh, realized I enjoyed more writing music than necessarily running around on stage playing music for people. I enjoy that and I enjoy what I do when I, I draw very much conducting music and recording it in the studio and working that way. But um, I kind of half, half jokingly say, you know, for John to survive, he, he needs he needs a very large group of people to love his music. He needs a million people to like his music. And if he wants to become, you want to get to be super famous, you need, you know, 20 million people to love your music. And I always kind of have joking to say, I need about 10 people to like my music. I need 10 Joel C. Highs to like my music and what I do. And, and if I give, develop those types of relationships, I get to do what I like to do. You know, I, I, I don't know if that's what John wants to. I don't think John wants to do that. I think that's a, a side product of what he does. But mine is very specifically as a composer, there aren't, there aren't that many other options that I'm aware of in the world, in the universe of, of the economy of music to survive as a composer. If you want to be a composer and a performer and a this or that, there's other ways to do it. But my particular produce, uh, producing music and writing music. So, I have, I don't know how many, but probably hundreds of syncs 
some of those things paid very little money up front. That wasn't, that wasn't uh, what made it work or not work. What made it work is the long term. So when I started working with people like Joel, I mean, one of the things I look at and you look at is, for me, it's something as simple as, well, what's, what do you think this film is going to be rated? Because, you know, if it's PG or PG-13, it's probably going to have a more easy trip to television. And what's important about television is, well, television produces performance royalties, just like you were playing it live in a concert hall. It's now on television. It's being performed, so to speak. Broadcast is, is a performance royalty. You know, when you get mu music into a film, you don't get any more money than the sync fee when it's playing in movie theaters. That's your money. But once it goes to cable, television, et cetera, these other uses is where it produces a, a, a back-end uh, revenue stream. And I've been very fortunate to get into films that have a big, good back-end, not because my music's in them. They have a good back-end because of who made the film, who's in the film. You know, when if Will Farrell's in a film, it just is going to play, you know. When Tyler Perry makes a film, it's going to play. You know, it's going to get into its own life cycle. And if your music's in those kind of films, you know, if you're in a Matt Damon film, you're going to see money for a long time on the back end of that. Might be a little, might be a lot. Just depends on how successful the film is. So <clears throat> the bands that carry my music to the world are actors and directors doing their work of which my music is being a part of it, as opposed to John, who carries his music to the world when he goes out and plays that music. So it's a very different kind of approach to um, a career. And, and in my case, it's, it's, it's specifically suited to what I like to do, which is write and record. And frankly, be honest about it, I love to pay musicians to do it. I really get as big a kick writing a check to John Cleary and to whoever I'm using on a session as I do being paid to do it. And there are times yeah. I spend more money than they pay me, you know, to do it because I believe in the long term of that music. Once I have it recorded and and holding it, it's gonna be okay. You know, I was going to say, Jay, I was going to say something specifically about that, because uh, when COVID hit and uh, production, everything shut down uh, March 13th, um, all of the music supervisors who were in the guild were kind of up in arms about like, what do we do? You know, our our source of revenue was cut off, but there's a lot of them who were still working and stuff. And we also realized that there was a lot of musicians whose main source of livelihood was totally cut off. There is no touring. There's no more of that. You know, uh, so we actually, you know, kind of took a little uh, oath about when we have an option about licensing music, those of us who are still able to do so and our productions are still going to really concentrate and look at how we spend our money. Like I said, we, we did a survey that the music supervisors on average are spending $1.8 million on music a year. And if you can parse that out to, uh, to artists who actually will do some good, who uh, usually make money by touring and of live shows and stuff, do it. You know, if you can balance, put your thumb on the scale in one way or another to help, uh, you know, you don't, it doesn't go to Ariana Grande. It can go to somebody else who might actually, you know, be able to eat off of it, do it. So it's been really important for us music supervisors because first and foremost, you know, we are, you know, working for these films, but we're all huge music fans. We do everything with music except for make it, like I said, we, but we listen to a lot. So, you know, helping musicians is really kind of what makes our days go. And anytime we can do that, like, like with Jay, and anytime I can give him something where he can hire musicians to go in the studio and work for me, that's what we're going to do. You know, I started, first started working with Jay right after Katrina, and we went to um, record one of Tyler Perry's second movie, the, uh, um, uh, was it Family Reunion? We did it in, we started in December of uh, 05 and recorded in January 06, right? At, at Piety Street, and they had uh, no running water, they had power, they didn't have internet or anything, and Jay actually had to go and find the LSO, the, the Louisiana Symphonic Orchestra players in Houston and everywhere to and ask them to come back for this recording session. And so we went back there, we could have recorded anywhere we wanted, but we went to Piety Street and recorded that score because Tyler Perry is from New Orleans. 
and we gave a lot of these musicians their first opportunity to come home and uh, to actually get paid for what they do and what they love. And it was, it was transformational for me. It was like totally like a huge light bulb goes off that what I do, while it seems like most of what I do is, is listen to music and push paper, actually does some good with people whose, you know, what they do is why I get up in the morning. So it's, you know, kind of like a rule of thumb for me going forward. Anytime I can go out there and license from somebody that actually could use it, that's what we're going to do. That's awesome. That's always known um, about you and your core values and something that I think is translates among all of um, the panelists. I mean, there's, there's, it's, there's a reason why we're all here together, right? I mean, we all have these, these common bonds around that. And, and, you know, that's why I, one of the things I love about the sync transaction is that it's like a bonus. It really does help, you know, it really does. And, you know, um, and that's, again, just to the whole point of this, this, you know, uh, this exercise is to demonstrate, you know, why it's important to be ready and why it's important to, um, to make sure that you have, that you're connecting all the dots to the, to the, um, collection points and to the organizations and to the, um, various, um, various opportunities to earn in the event that those opportunities come your way. Um, one last question, and, and just for those of you in the chat that for the questions that haven't been answered, what Jean and I'll do is we'll go through and if, if there are questions that were not answered, we can get in touch with you all. So I mean, you, know, you can set up appointments with, with, with me individually as well. But um, Joel, is there beyond, you know, you know, sending out your mercenaries, and you know, working with artists like John, who you know everyone knows, and people who have you know lots of live gigs, is there a place? I mean, I know that Jazz and Heritage used to have the talent talent exchange online, where folks could upload their music, and that's not that's not really um, available anymore because I don't think. Well, I don't know that a lot of people were using it, but there were some inherent problems with that. Is there a place now beyond? beyond you know, the existing relationships you have that you or some other music supervisors that you may know, like go to Access? I mean, do any of you ever go to Bandcamp or anything like that? Or is that just? It's, uh, we tend to not, you know, there are a lot of sources, but I have so many people, like I get up in the morning and I look at my inbox and it is, uh, it is all cold call emails and stuff that I literally get up in the morning. And if it doesn't look like I can see in the log line, what they've written, I can see in a little bit. And if it's not like, Hey, Joel, I love this show that you're on. And my music is really similar to this song that you used in there doesn't have the basic research and shows that they've done it. And if it's just like, hello, music supervisor, I have music, take it. I'm delete, delete, <laughs> delete, 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 delete. I spent hours in the morning deleting emails that are cold hit with me. So I tend to go to, like I said, trusted sources. There's a lot of people who are um, clearing houses that they, they take music from small labels, from individual artists, and they're a trusted source for me. They'll do the due diligence to research that stuff. Okay, thank um, you. I tell people all the time, it's all about, I mean, I hate it because it sounds so, meh, but it's networks, 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 building relationships, maintaining and trust. relationships. And, and I usually, yeah, trust too. Careful with that trust word, but but yes, trust. Well, yeah, well, dependability, how's that? Yes, 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 relationship oh. building. So yeah, so I, I appreciate that. I think that's something that people need to hear. So. Yeah, and here's, and I'll tell you this, just because I know everybody asked this for, for these panels, it's like, how do we reach music supervisors? It's very simple. Google it, find out who the music supervisors are on shows that you like and you think your music is like. There's a great tool called IMDB Pro that you can go on that actually lists their contact information. So if you see somebody who's on a show that you want to do that, a lot of times their contact information is there. So I'm on IMDB Pro. IMDB Pro costs some money. So you don't always have to do it. Find somebody who's got it. Find out somebody who has your, um, you know, who, who's doing work that you think they would really enjoy your music. Do research on what they're working on and, you know, do a real sales pitch and say, look, I think that my music, no, yeah, no, your music too. And say, my music is similar to things that you've used before. And I'm a big fan of your work. Blow smoke up, up people's butts. It always helps. 
and uh, and say, you know, in a very personal thing, don't do blanket emails. That stuff gets deleted so fast. And just say, look, I, you know, and that's, you know, when you're cold emailing like that, you know, the little personal touches and doing your research really help, you know, because, uh, you know, I, I, like I said, I'm spend an hour every morning deleting emails, and it's harsh, but and I could be missing the best music in the world. But if uh, they don't spend the time to do the basic research on this stuff, then I tend to distrust it anyway. Yeah, no, that's, that's, that's great. Thank you for that. Um, I, I, I tell my clients all the time, invest in, you know, the resources you need and in, you know, your work and in your business as much, if not more than you would expect others to invest in you, right? Yeah. I mean, you've got to, you've got to do yeah. that. Are there any closing thoughts that the three of you have before? Don't, don't send attachments yeah. to send. Oh links. yeah. Don't send Those attachments to me either, by the way, <laughs> unless I ask for them. Send links. <laughs> yeah, yeah, because those, those, those songs, those, yeah, they just clog your inbox, but it's unfortunate well, well, it is. Yeah. Well, closing, well, you know, what I would say is, is you know, to me, and I've got a great dear friend, Joel has him too, George S. Clinton, who's an amazing composer and arranger, and George, um, has succinctly put it, and I share it with my students, and I'll share it here. Is you know, there are three things he has noticed in terms of having success in this industry, the industry of film and television music. And you know, one is education, and obviously, these kind of panels and going to school and music school is an educational process. The more you do that, the more you can develop your skill. And what I always tell people who want to do what I do. You have to learn, as John points out, sort of another way of looking at what John said about me, is you have to learn how to do the things John doesn't want to do. And John doesn't have the time to learn to do. So I, I and, and so the musicians I work with, I fill a niche for them. And the other thing you're always pointing about, Ashley, is networking, is how important networking is and letting people know of your existence. And Joel's telling you ways to do that. And you can use the internet nowadays to do it, but you need to be more specific than hi, I'm here, you know, blah, blah. So Joel's giving you great tips on that. And then the third thing is one New Orleanians seem to like the least to hear about, especially in New Orleans, is uh, luck. And the way luck can work is you need to put yourself in places where luck can happen. You know, it's, you're not going to walk the streets of New Orleans and bump into 20 music supervisors and go to bars at night and run into directors who are looking for composers or this or that. So pre-COVID, I spend three or four or five times a year traveling to Los Angeles, New York, where, where people are, and networking up there and then making them part of your network. So you can do something about it. And that's when luck can happen. You know, you can increase the chances that you're going to be fortunate. It is cha more challenging. I have been super lucky here, but my path took me through orchestrating for Terrence Blanchard. And frankly, those two or three years I've worked with Terrence, I then met Joel, who was here with Lionsgate, and that was sort of a stamp on my forehead. Joel said to me, I mean, I assume, because he did, his first words weren't send me your music. His first words were one of, oh, you must know what you're doing. Now let me hear your music. It was a different approach. So that kind of interfacing and putting yourself in a position for good luck to happen is something that I think people here need to probably spend a little more time out of here at times when you're able to and, and meet some folk and build those kind of relationships and then calls do come in. So I think those also are in, in Louisiana, when people were shooting films and stuff like that, you find out where they're shooting because the directors are there. So yeah. <laughs> you become, we worked, Jay and I worked on a movie together where the composer got the gig because they, uh, you know, went uh, elbow to elbow with the uh, director at some bar in New Orleans. And he, he was like, oh, you're a director? Huh, let me give you my CD. And it worked. There you have it. There you have it. Do, John, do you have anything that you would like to relay before we, before we get to um, No, I think everyone's been fairly comprehensive in all the various uh, aspects of the discussion. You know, music is not an, the music business is not an exact science, and um, it varies from one person to the next. So I think you have to find a way that it works for you. 
but basically, yeah, ultimately, work really hard on what you do, be as good as you can, and um, what you don't, wherever, identify your where your weak areas are and get people to come and help you. So if you have great songs but don't know how to get all the paperwork in order, find someone that can, can do that stuff for you. I'm lucky I've got managers and I have someone that does my publishing stuff. And so I can just wear my musician's hat and think about music all day long and not worry about that other stuff. And that's my personal preference. I don't like all the other stuff, frankly. I'd quite happily just sit here at the piano all day, but it's quite not, kind of nice to be able to afford to buy a po' boy as well. <laughs> so you have that's to, what I'm, that, I, 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 start love that, I love that stuff. So, you know, if, if, you like John, if you're if you're good at this, if you're good at this and you decide that you want to devote sufficient time to be really, really good at it, which means doing it to the exclusion of working on a building site or washing dishes or running a corporation or whatever other job options are out there. If you're going to do that, then um, do it to the best of your ability and, and get the help from other people uh, when you need it or advice, I should say. And, um, and, uh, and just do what you do as well as you can do it. And, you know, and it's not always going to work. And yeah. we'd be aware of the fact that it might not work, but you do it because you love it. And uh, I only do it because I'm no good at anything else. <laughs> <laughs> I can't do anything. I'm quite good at washing dishes. I could get a job washing dishes, but well, actually, I'm not even very good at that. I always use a dishwasher instead. Yeah, so. my skills don't translate to anything else. This is about <laughs> it. This is about all I'm good for. <laughs> <laughs> Well, thank you all so much for your wealth of insight and experience. And I really do love just the contrast that has been offered today, because again, I mean, you know, you've got John Cleary, a great songwriter, great recording artist, very well-known performer. You've got Jay, who's totally awesome and out, you know, making compositions all the time. I have no idea how, how, you cut that many compositions like I mean you just wake up spitting them out you know that's how I picture your process it's like you wake up and just the, the notes are flowing it's so, filthy yeah it's yeah it's so funny but um it's been it's, it's been tremendous for me and I'm, I'm sure that it has been for um the fellow attendees so thank you all very much and for those of you who would like to um to avail yourselves of the services that John does not want to do that he talks about, that's where we come in handy. So, um, Gene, you can close it out if you'd like, unless, you know, the three of you have something else to say. I just no, want to- Thank you. This was I'm awesome. Sorry. I'm really glad you, you came up with this idea of getting us together and, and doing this this panel. I, you know, this, this is your idea. This is- It was, wasn't is, it? So this is another, <laughs> this is very, very Joel C. You know, he calls me in, in March, right? Before, well, I think it was February to tell me about his role, new role, the Guild of Music Supervisors. And he's like, I just want to help New Orleans. Let's figure this out. So this is all you. And that's to say, to suggest that New Orleans and New Orleans artists, musicians, sorry, John, you're a musician. You're an artist too, by the way. Um, you know, I mean, you have you have people that want, like, like Joel has said over and over today, who want to help, who want to use your music, who want to you know, provide you with the resources that you need to be able to engage in this process. It's totally freaking awesome. It's like, you know, not everyone in Los Angeles is unapproachable, right? Or in elsewhere. I mean, look at him. He's like got the biggest smile, you know, he's like ready to like put money in your mailbox. So that's, like, that's me. Less to be learned from that. Yeah, yeah. So thank you. Gene, I'll pass the mic to you. Thank, thank you guys. Thank you to Joel, Jay, and John, and of course, Ashley, and all of y'all um, for, for being with us, for joining us for the questions that, that we got to. And yeah, as Ashley said, just to reiterate, you know, Ella Project does provide assistance with making sure that your catalogs are in order to make sure that you have your copyrights taken care of. If you do need something as, as simple as a work for hire or, or just a band agreement, all that stuff we do, um, just go to our webpage at ellanola.org and fill out an application and we'd be happy to talk to you guys and uh, help you continue to create the music and the art that makes New Orleans so beautiful and makes it the place that we want to be. So thank you all for doing what you're doing. We're going to keep doing what we're yeah. doing. And for now, I think we're going to sign off. So everybody take care. Thanks again. Thank you. Thanks everyone. Thank you. Bye, Bye now.